So there's a, definitely no need to have Alexa in your bedroom, or at least Amazon's Alexa. But that does not to say that there isn't a place for voice control in your home and ubiquitously in your home, right? Voice control is going to be everywhere in your home. And because of the nature of it, it is always listening. Who owns the AI that searches for the knowledge that you need or manages your home's energy use or lets you speak and get the music you want on demand? AI or artificial intelligence is clearly more and more central to our lives. We interact with it daily, in fact, moment to moment, from the predictive text in our messaging to our web searches to most of our digital activity and commerce and our homes as well. In this episode of Techverse, we're chatting with someone who is building open source AI, AI that you could, if you want, get the code for, you could use, you could add to, enhance, or you could just deploy for yourself. Most won't do that, of course, but it speaks to a future in which we might be able to get smart assistance from AIs that only work for us, for our interests, and not for some corporations. Our guest is Michael Lewis, CEO of Mycroft AI. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here as well. Uh, let's start here. Explain the name Mycroft for those who haven't read any Sherlock Holmes. Sure. Uh, so Mycroft actually comes from a uh, Robert Heinlein book called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And uh, in that book, um, there's a sentient uh, AI uh, that um, comes online and it goes by a lot of different names in the, in the book. Uh, but Mycroft is the, uh, is the main name. That okay. They also call it Mike. But That's really Mycroft interesting. Is the to, uh, hey. to the Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Absolutely. That's where I took yeah. it from, right? I thought it was the Mycroft who was Sherlock Holmes' brother, who was a, supposed to be smarter than Sherlock, but was much more uh, retiring in his public life. Let's put it that way. I had forgotten yeah. about Heinlein's Mycroft. So excellent. Who owns most of the AI that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, uh, it's pretty clear that you don't and we don't. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, the, most of the AI that we use in our everyday lives right now is actually, you know, uh, owned by the big three or big four, you know, uh, tech companies. We've got uh, Google and Amazon, uh, Apple has a very, you know, uh, tight knit closed ecosystem and, uh, yeah, and it's not us. <laughs> Definitely not us. Maybe Facebook in there as well. A couple others oh, yeah. and pretty much any, any private company of size or public company of size. Why does that matter? Well, um, it matters for a bunch of reasons. Um, one, uh, you're not in control of your data. So, you know, you don't know whether or not what they're collecting about you is correct or not, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they get a selective view of your interactions and then they're using that for whatever purposes they have, whether it's for actually providing services to you, um, or for marketing to you, uh, or for reselling to other people for marketing purposes. Um. You know, you don't know, necessarily know that that's an accurate view of, of who you are, right? Um, but, you know, more insidious reasons that this is important is that um, data, you know, in aggregate is, um, is just that. It's just, it's an average. They get an average view of how things are. And what we get fed back is the result of these averages and these trends. And so, you know, the way I like to think about it is, uh, um, I was actually thinking, of, thinking about explaining it to my, to my kids. And uh, if you were to think about like rolling a, a six-sided die, right? You're going to get a one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? What's the average result? Three and a half. How many times are you ever going to roll a three and a half? Never, right? <laughs> and so we're, we're all individuals here and uh, we have our own particular preferences and, and desires and things that we care about. Um, but we get treated as these, these big averages, right? Um, and so I think that that's a real problem. It doesn't allow for as much individualization, you know, uh, as much uh, representation, uh, whether you're in a, a minority group or a less, less well-represented group, whether you're maybe even in a, a group that's, you know, um, being discriminated against in, in various parts of the world, right? And so... And there's other reasons as well, right? I mean, like you mentioned, the data they get may not be accurate. It may be more scary if the data is accurate. <laughs> I mean, well, like, that's, that's pretty pretty accurate. accurate data. I, I, I haven't turned on, let's say, Alexa on the mm -hmm. sound bar, the Sonos <laughs> sound bar in my bedroom, just because, well, I don't really need Amazon in my bedroom, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the, the movie Gattaca, for example, is another 
you know, example of this, right. You know, you could be discriminated against just based on your genetics or, um, yeah. So, uh, there's a, definitely no need to have, uh, you know, Alexa in your bedroom, uh, but, um, or at least Amazon's Alexa. Um, so, uh, but that does not to say that there isn't a place for voice control in your home and ubiquitously in your home, right? Voice control is going to be everywhere in your home. And because of the nature of it, it is always listening. And so I think yeah. that's a very good point. I think that's a great point. I mean, just because I don't want Amazon in my bedroom doesn't mean I can't benefit from smart assistance, AI assistance in my home, wherever I am. Doesn't mean I can't benefit from AI assistance in my financial life, which I may choose to keep more secret as well. Other things like that, um, I could definitely benefit from smart assistance and I could see that in the next decades as well. So there's been a lot of attempts at open sourcing AI. Um, OpenAI, the organization be behind GPT-3, started out as open, seems pretty close right now. Why is open source AI hard? Well, open source anything is hard uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, it's still a relatively new phenomenon, despite the fact that the Linux kernel has been around for decades now. And it's, you know, widely adopted. It's in all of the OSs, you know, it's, it's the underpinning of, you know, all of the Apple OSs, the Microsoft OSs, you know, obviously Android, you know, it's, it's everywhere, right? It's basically everything is built on Linux, which is, you know, makes it a very successful open source project. Um, you know, it's, it's still hard to, for people to wrap their heads around, well, okay, if it's free and it's open, how do I make money on it? Right. And so there's a real paradigm shift that, you know, we have to think about, well, what is it that we're doing that is valuable, right? Is it writing the code that's valuable or is it something else? And, um, and I think that's one of the, the key, key issues with, uh, any kind of open source project, whether it's AI, right? Yeah. I mean, the interesting part, and I started going there, um, a couple of minutes ago is if I had an AI that I knew was safe, that I knew that perhaps I controlled or that I had access to everything that that AI did, everything it knew, even its code, even if I can't personally read its code and understand its code and add to its code, that would make it more likely that I would trust that AI at, at minimum to keep my secrets, to maintain my privacy, to do whatever, those sorts of things. Talk about what Mycroft is doing. Sure. Uh, so, well, uh, in its, uh, at the very basic level, you know, if you look at it, look at the front page of our website, for example, uh, what we have is a, uh, a privacy respecting smart speaker. So like a Google home or an Amazon Alexa sits in your kitchen or, you know, in your bedroom or wherever you want to have it. Uh, and it, you know, you can do all the basic things that you can do with those other devices. You can play music, you can set timers, you can ask it about, you know, the weather or random internet factoids and, and that kind of thing. And so it's a, it's basically a, uh, I think of it as like sort of a, a web browser, you know, kind of interface that, um, that you interact with, you know, using your voice. Right. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the first level of what we're doing. It's an open source, completely privacy respecting solution to that. Um, so, but beyond that, what we're really building is a platform because, uh, you know, we want to enable homes of the future to be smart. You know, like I grew up watching Star Trek. I want to be able to say, you know, computer, you know, dim the lights in the kitchen whatever, right? <laughs> yes. and, and know that that's my computer. That's not being, you know, sent up to a cloud somewhere and then, you know, bounced off a satellite and then back down or whatever. But there's no reason for that to leave my house, right? Mm -hmm. We have the capability to, to do all of this work on the edge right now. So, um, that's sort of the next step. And then beyond that. Well, we've got some more pie in the sky kinds of ideas. Well, that's interesting to talk about, of course. I mean, because that becomes very interesting. As we said off the top, most of our experience with AI, in fact, you, you could argue perhaps all of it is AI that somebody else owns, that somebody else has created, that somebody else is monetizing in some fashion, in some way, whose interests are, they may align with ours in some cases, but they may not align with ours in other cases. What I do wonder is if at some point in the future, we will 
and I, I, I struggle with the language here because when you talk AI right now, we're not talking sentient systems, obviously. We're not talking self-aware systems. So you can say, will I own my own AI? That may change over time. You know, the, the legal status, the moral status of AI may change over time, the long term, obviously. But will I ever own my own AI that I can use that uh, would give me financial advice, stock advice, uh, other things like that, that I could say, hey, you know what, you know everything I know, you see everything I see, and you're like a smart advisor or a memory, uh, you know, on demand, other things. Do you, do you see that future? Um, that is one way that things can go. But as you alluded to, I think that there are some problematic aspects to that, you know. If you own something that's sentient, well, you know, we know that that's problematic. <laughs> yes, that's very problematic. There have been wars fought over that. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> finished with the consequences yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I actually personally have a problem with this, you know. Uh, and so when, uh, when I came on board in uh, Minecraft a couple of years ago and really started thinking about this, um, what I gravitated towards was the idea of AI not being artificial intelligence or, you know, a, a sentience in a way, but more of an augmenting intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So in the same way that smartphones have become this external memory for ourselves, right? Uh, you know, I don't know how many phone numbers you can remember right now, but I should remember like a couple, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, but we have hundreds of them stored in our smartphones, right? And, uh, and we can call them up on a moment's notice. And yeah, so, so it's become sort of an external memory of ours. And, Computers are augmenting our abilities in other ways. And um, the way I see AI, the, the AI that I want to create, I guess I should say, is one that augments my own abilities, mm -hmm. right? And makes me more capable. Mm -hmm. I get hundreds of emails every single day, right? I don't want to um, necessarily have somebody else go through all of those emails and figure out which ones I want to read. Mm -hmm. I just want to get faster at going through them myself. and uh, and being able to get rid of them, right? Um, navigating the complexities of, you know, signing up for a new internet service or whatever, right? You know, yes. it shouldn't be that hard, but you know, they make all these sign up procedures labyrinth and, and uh, I, uh, you know, but being able to navigate that stuff more easily is something that a computer could could really help us with, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I I like to think of it as uh, you know augmenting ourselves to make ourselves more capable of navigating the increasingly complex digital world that we live in. I, I like that a lot. And I like that um, because there are things that are just way too challenging, like, you know, coordinate the schedules of all my friends and get us a, a reservation at a Greek restaurant in the city. Right. You know, right. like you ought to be able to give that task to an agent, have it do it and manage it. And it can interact with the other people's agents so that they don't have to you know, like say, well, I'm free Tuesday, but only till four o'clock and then blah, 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 blah. Right. right? Yeah, absolutely. that makes a ton of sense. And that doesn't require sentience. That doesn't require artificial general intelligence. Let's put it that way. Those are just smart systems that you could own like you own software if we still own software do you still own software i don't know we usually rent it right now or we just yeah. pay for it with our attention <laughs> by right. the right. ads so you could theoretically own those i i think the problem of owning a, a sentience that's probably much farther out on the horizon i don't know some say never some say 50 years some say we already have it um yeah. but it is a, a definitely a, a problem of the future Indeed. Um, yeah. And like I said, I think that's one that, I, you know, personally, I don't feel like I need to get involved with. You know, you <laughs> could have a, uh, something that passes the Turing test, right? And you can't tell whether it's a human or a, an, an AI, um, but that still doesn't tell us whether it's an AI. I mean, it's a definitional test, right? The mm -hmm. idea behind that test is that if you can't tell the difference, then, well, it is sentient, right? Uh, I'm not sure that I necessarily buy into that definition. Um, but if you do buy into that definition, then the problem of creating something that can interact with you uh, through natural language is is almost the same uh, problem as you know creating an artificial intelligence. And so, you know, I agree. Around those issues, I agree. I think that test is 
far insufficient. But I also do agree with you that if we do eventually create something that has some level of consciousness, some internal dialogue, some, you know, human recognizable intelligence level, uh, some beingness, as hard as it might be for us to imagine a machine owning that or possessing that or being that, uh, we will have to rethink how we treat our machines, how, how we deal with them, what place they have in our society and in our lives. In any case, you currently have the voice assistant. You can buy that, put that in your house. Uh, what does that interact with? What does that engage with? I can't imagine the ecosystem is as large as Alexa has built, um, but what does that work with right now? Um, well, right, what we have right out of the box is the 10 most uh, commonly used uh, functions on your typical smart speaker. So like I said, we've got uh, internet radio, thousands of stations. Um, we've got, uh, you can play it as a jukebox. You can play your own MP3 selection if you want. Um, you've got uh, all the timers uh, and, you know, alarms and, you know, things of that nature. The very, you know, all the basic stuff you can query, you know, through DuckDuckGo, Wikipedia, have do simple like calculations through Wolfram Alpha, you know, how many teaspoons are in a gallon or whatever. <laughs> um, and all this through a natural language interface. How many milliliters are there in a mile? Yes, I'd like <laughs> exactly. <yes. laughs> um, and so, uh, so that's that's the basics. Uh, in addition, we also interface with um, Home Assistant, and they control, you know, and they have a, a system that's been uh, widely deployed. Uh, that it interfaces with thousands of IOT devices throughout your home, right? So, um, so we'll be able to, you know, uh, uh, provide a voice interface to all of those smart, uh, devices throughout your home. Excellent. Excellent. Um, super interesting stuff. I'm sure it's early days. I'm sure there's much more to, to create and to build. One of the challenges of making AI smarter is the availability, accessibility of data. How are you solving that as a smaller company building something that's open source? Yeah, well, uh, we've, from the beginning, community has been one of the, the pillars of, of our company. Uh, by, we have a, a fairly robust community uh, of contributors, both at the source code level, uh, as well as at the data level. And, uh, so we recognize that data is important for creating, uh, you know, creating these AI driven systems, but, you know, we also know that, you know, it's not that much data. You don't need, you know, everyone's a voice to be sampled in order to get an accurate representation of how to do speech to text translation or text to speech and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, purely based on the voluntary contributions of our community. Um, and, and various communities around the web, um, because there are a lot of open source communities that are contributing data to various data sets. Um, you know, we've been able to build the tools that we need. And so that's, that's how we envision going forward. And like I said, you know, the tools that we will build in the future will be very personal. So if I want to speak in a colloquial way with my voice assistant, I will teach it how I speak, mm -hmm. right? And so if I say something that it doesn't understand, it can say, well, I'm not sure what you meant. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, I meant, you know, set an alarm, you know, then it could say, oh, well, now I know that's how you work. But that doesn't necessarily get broadcast to the, you know, thousands of other users who have a similar profile to me or whatever, because that's a very personal thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we're uh, planning on building a system where the, uh, your AI learns with you and uh, and it becomes a very personalized experience. Excellent. Thank you for your time. Oh, of course. <laughs>